Good morning and welcome to, I think, our fourth Donuts with Di. Hopefully you or and if you're participating with your team or enjoying your donuts. I certainly am. And um, hello, Lori. Good morning, Lori. Good morning. Yes. So we want you to check in real quick. So if you could in the chat box, type in your name, your county, and the role you play in early intervention. Go ahead and do that now. So, and as you're, oh, looks like we have several uh, teams today. Um, so, we have um, all over the place, Ashtabula, way up northwest, northeast, <laughs> um, Licking, Mahoning, Madison, Putnam, Lucas, Wood. So, we have um, service coordinators, DSs. We have full teams, so that would include the therapist, uh, Preble, Noble. So we have large counties, medium counties, and small counties. Lorraine, Fulton County. All right, so we've got all, um, people, uh, all over. So we really appreciate that. So I have the pleasure of introducing our content experts for today. Sandy and Jackie are employed by the F Family Child Learning Center, which is a collaborative effort of Akron Children's Hospital and Kent State University, and is a nationally recognized research and training program. They are part of FCLC's team of audiologists and speech therapists who provide family training and counseling and home visits to families of young children with hearing loss in 55 Ohio counties through telepractice. So FCLC is one of Dodd's contractors to provide um, family training, counseling, and home visiting services to um, families of young children with hearing loss. So it is with pleasure that I introduce first Jackie. Um, she's a speech uh, pathologist. She's worked on the staff of the FCLC's Regional Infant Hearing Program for 14 years. Through FCLC's contract with Early Intervention between 2007 and 2013, Jackie also participated on the Summit County um, Evaluation and Assessment Team as a speech language therapist. Most recently, through the evidence-based EI grant awarded to Mahoney County Board of Disabilities uh, from Dodd, she provided virtual coaching in accordance with the training she received from Dr. Sheldon and Rush in order to build the capacity of the Mahoney County Court Team. Sandy is an audiologist and has worked um, with FCLC since its inception in the 1990s. She's also an educational audiology, audiologist, and she's also participated in a number of state work and stakeholder groups to help promote best practice. Today, they will facilitate our topic, and that is supporting um, families of young children with hearing loss, particularly assessing. What should um, assessors know about um, assessing children who may have um, hearing loss? But first, I'm going to turn it over to Lori, and she will explain how to obtain your PDUs. Lori, take it away. Thank you, Di. So, in order to get your CPDUs for this webinar, um, all you'll need to do is email a sign-in sheet to our administrative assistant, Shaquilla Dixon. And I just sent a message in the chat box with Shaquilla's email. Um, it's shaquilla.dixon at dodd.ohio.gov. And you can use any sign-in sheet that you have locally or even just a blank piece of paper. And you want to include your name, your county, your role, your email, and your signature. And if you have a group that's all watching together, that's fine. Um, it's not necessary for each person to register, but just make sure everybody's included on that sign-in sheet. And then Shaquilla will process the certificates and she'll email them to you um, in the order that she receives those sign-in sheets. Um, and she's also available if you have any questions about the process. 
I think that is about it. Um, are there any questions about that process? <coughs> Give everyone just a second in case there are questions. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, if you do have questions as we go through, please feel free to type them into either your chat box or your questions box, and we will monitor those and um, either answer them throughout the presentation, or in some cases we might wait to answer them at the end, or they might be answered later in the presentation. All right. I think that's all for me. So I am going to go ahead and turn things over to Sandy and Jackie. Okay. Thank you, Lori and Diane. Um, this is Sandy, and I'm going to start talking first. And I want to let you all know that we will make the PowerPoint available after our talk. And also, we have some handouts we've shared with our counties, and we'll make those available with, for you guys as well. So this is our plan for the next hour or so. First, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the ear works and um, hearing loss. And when I do that, I I'd like you to all kind of put yourself in the parent's position, listening how the ear works. After you've just found out your kiddo had a hear has a hearing loss, because what we typically know is that once families hear hearing loss, they don't hear much else. <clears throat> and that's why we've got the experts on the team to help families understand the hearing loss. One moment, please. <clears throat> After that, Jackie will talk about normal auditory development. <clears throat> and we're going to look at two paths of how a kiddo with hearing loss can get into early intervention. First, with a diagnosed hearing loss. And second, they might come into EI for another reason and later be diagnosed with hearing loss. And we're gonna do that by looking at some of our case histories. And we'll briefly look at syndromes, high risk factors, and red flags. So let us begin. Um, first off, I'm gonna pull up a little clip to show you how the ear works. Just one second. Which functions as a funnel collecting the sound vibrations and directing them toward the eardrum. As sound vibrations are picked up by the eardrum, they are transferred to a series of three tiny bones in the middle ear. These bones further amplify the vibrations of the eardrum and transfer them to a sensory organ in the inner ear called the cochlea. The inside of the cochlea is filled with fluid and lined with tens of thousands of tiny hair cells. As vibrations pass through the fluid, it causes movement of these hair cells. This motion causes electrical signals to be sent along a specialized nerve, which are then processed into the sounds we hear. <coughs> okay, just one sec. Okay. Okay. Um, so that is a brief description of our how the ear works. And I'm going to discuss briefly of where hearing loss occurs. Um, and just to reiterate what you just heard on that little clip. Um, oh, shucks, and I don't have a pointer. But there's the ear canal. You can see that, the outer ear canal. And hearing loss can occur there um, from swimmer's ear when there are infections in the ear canal. Um, we also, and that would be temporary. We also have a number of kiddos who are born with no ear canal or with a very narrow ear canal so that sound doesn't get through efficiently. Um, some of our babies with Down syndrome have teeny little 
ear canal. So even a little piece of wax can block that ear canal off and obstruct sound from getting in. I'm sorry. Hello, this is Diane. We're getting a report yep. that um, they're not able to hear. So we have one person saying that they can't hear. Can Is anyone else having difficulty hearing? No. Okay. Okay, it looks like it's a, a, a one-person thing. Okay, I just didn't want you to get, get going until we figured out if it was a system issue, if it was maybe um, Tracy's issue. So, okay. We'll work with Tracy off uh, off the air here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> then you see at the end of the ear canals, the eardrum, and that's really just like a couple layers of skin or cellophane. And attached to that eardrum are those three little bones. <clears throat> and those bones may be fused or may not be present, and that can cause hearing loss. <clears throat> sometimes medically treatable, sometimes not. And also um, children could get fluid behind the eardrum in the middle ear. And that um, again will cause hearing loss. And usually it's temporary and medically treatable, but certainly you might need the expertise of your um, early intervention hearing services person for these families as well. What we really look at a lot are those kiddos who have hearing loss in the cochlea or inner ear. And if we were to open up the cochlea, you'll see, I think this is so cool. It's set up like a piano. So we have the high and squeaky pitches out toward the end of the cochlea. And deep inside, we have the um, hair cells for our lower pitches. If you look at the cochlea beside the one with the full keyboard, you'll see some of those keys are missing. And that's what it's like when we have hearing loss. Some of the hair cells are there and some are not. So when we put a hearing aid on a child, that hearing aid is driving the keys that are there. And that's why, yes, the child may hear, but they're not hearing clearly because they're not working with a, a fully functioning cochlea. If you look at those couple pictures just below that, there's a group of hair cells um, that are healthy. The center picture, look at how symmetrical those hair cells are. Those are healthy as well. And then you could see, um, again, the normal hair cells. Um, next one down. So if we were to have hearing loss in the cochlea, most likely those hair cells um, are not all present. They're not set up so nice and symmetrically. When we have a, a child with hearing loss, um, the audiologist will plot their hearing loss on an audiogram. And this is just such an abstract concept for families to, to grasp and understand. So what we'll do is plot that hearing test onto the audiogram to help the family understand what the child is hearing functionally. Um, we've done a number of focus groups and family interviews, and, and they've said, man, they love their audiologist, but those they're kind of on the scientific end of things. While we know here in EI, we're talking about function and routines, and that's what the family appreciates so much about hearing their child's hearing loss here on the speech banana. So if you look up at the chart, a person with normal hearing will hear at zero for each pitch. And those pitches are designated by 125, 250, 500, up to 8,000. The pitches on the left side are low pitch. And then as we move to the right, those get more high and squeaky. So if we have someone with normal hearing, they'll hear everything from zero down. Let's say we have a child who has um, a middle ear infection or a mild permanent hearing loss. They could hear at 30 straight across for each pitch. 
So they're hearing everything from 30 down. But look at what they're missing. Even just with an ear infection, they're not hearing the Z or the V, the F, T, H, or S. Those are just sounds that are like air coming out of our mouth. And maybe they'll catch them when they're close to their family, but you move just a little bit away and those sounds are gone. And that's something we'll be talking about a lot in the next hour is how hearing loss really looks so inconsistent. We hear families saying, yeah, but he hears his name and he may hear his name when you're close or instead of Sandy, he might be hearing Andy and think that's his name. So we can't always count on observation. That's why hearing tests are so darn important. Just looking at the speech banana a little more, you could see a child, um, if they're hearing at 60 straight across, without hearing aids, they are not hearing speech. We also have hearing loss where let's say 250 and 500 is normal, but then their hearing loss goes down in the high pitches. Wow, that is really a tough one. Parents are going to say, this child hears. And we once again know, yep, they're hearing those vowels, but they're not getting the consonant. And what the brain needs is a clear and consistent message to develop. Um, finally, kiddos who like hear around 90 or below, those are our kiddos who get cochlear implants, because even with hearing aids, they're not going to hear speech. So um, I'm going to let you listen to our hearing loss simulator for a minute. And um, once again, just to help you think about hearing loss is just so inconsistent when we observe it. So when we add noise or distance, that's when it's even more hard to hear. OK. So this is one person oh, talking. Paddling all day, watching otters play in the water. The fish. That's normal. And here's just a mild loss. And so, yeah, you're, you're saying to yourself, yep, Sandy, I hear that. But you can already tell those consonants are missing from what the speaker's saying, which is fine for us. We can kind of fill in those gaps, but a baby does not have the language experience to fill in the gaps. And their brain development will, will be delayed for vocabulary and language because they're not getting the full, consistent, crystal clear message they need. And here's moderate loss. Again, the parent is so right when they say the child can hear. Yep, they can hear, but they're not making out the words. Let's try another one dialogue of two people. Yeah, always busy. That's why I got our tickets in advance. Everyone seems to love the show. Here's mild. Now listen, I'm going to pause it a minute. Listen to mild, but walk away from your computer a little bit. And that's when the child is, let's say, six feet away from mom and dad. Yeah, maybe that baby's hearing while mom's holding her, and giving her a bottle. But once you move away a few feet, you're losing even more of the speech signal. Do you hear how like even that S wasn't there? And here's moderate. Barely audible, but yeah, there's something there. Not enough to learn to talk or learn to read because reading comes from the auditory portion of our brain. And that's why for years we've had kiddos who are deaf who only reach third grade reading level. We'll just do one more here. And again, you add noise, you add a television in the background, man, that baby's not hearing. Okay, so let's, I think we've made our point. Oh, 
one second. Okay. Um, okay, so that is a point I want to make here is how important it is then for um, us to have the audiogram for the um, for the child when we're working with them in early intervention. Because um, as you can see, hearing loss between each child can be so different. And the thing that's so darn important is that, yes, we know the child has hearing loss, but it goes beyond the ears. It's actually brain development because those first three years of life is when it's so darn important for a child to have that crystal clear message to the brain. That's when the pathways in the brain are being set down and being reinforced. So if that child is only hearing part of what's being said, those neural pathways are not being fully developed. And in fact, they're gonna be paired away. So we're really looking at a delay. That's why working with these kiddos with hearing loss early is preventative um, to prevent those delays. There's a really cool study um, that just came out of Cincinnati Children's Hospital where they looked at all of the EI data from Ohio and connected it to the data for the kids, same children going to school. And they found if a child starts early intervention by three months, they're at the same level for reading readiness as their kindergarten peers. But if they don't start until after six months, there's, there's a delay by the time they get to kindergarten. Um, and one other piece of data that just is just amazing to me. We know that if a child wears their hearing aid three hours a day, it will take them three years to catch up to one year of listening. Um, and because of all of what I just told you, that's why there um, we have universal newborn hearing screening now. And it, um, the guidelines we follow is the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing, and we follow the 136 goals, where we want all newborns to have a hearing screening before one month of age, um, a diagnostic evaluation by three months, and to enter early intervention by six months. And now we know, wow, we want them even before six months because it makes a, a difference. Okay, um, very briefly, what, what we've all done in RIP and early intervention for kiddos with hearing loss is we've had lots and lots of ex experience with kiddos who have hearing loss. And what we know now and what literature shows us is that it's not just the hearing loss that counts. We might have two kiddos with mild hearing loss, but their outcomes and their, what their families want and need could be very different. And some of those reasons is because when did the child get the hearing loss? If the child is born with a hearing loss, their development will look more delayed than a child whose hearing loss starts at two years old. Not only when it happens, but when is it identified? If a child's born with a hearing loss, but it's not identified till they're two, we're going to find a lot more needs. Same with age of amplification. Were they born with a hearing loss? We want to get those hearing aids on them as soon as possible. Start spoken language, start signing if that's what the family wants, get that language going. And really important is when they achieve full-time hearing aid use. And um, we know all babies are going to take those hearing aids out and put them in their mouths, but there are different techniques um, and different things like pilot caps we can use to help babies' fingers stay away from those aids. Other things um, that can affect a child's hearing and their development and outcomes would be the degree of hearing loss. The <coughs> nature, which would mean is it from ear infections or is it from... Um, the hair cells in their inner ear, 
Do they hear better in some pitches than other? And then what's so important is the listening environment. What's it like at home? Is there a lot of TV going on? Are there a lot of um, conversations happening that's not within the child's reach? And absolutely the number one um, factor is family interactions. And just like I know everyone on the team is working with the family to be working on turn taking and expansion and things like that to develop language. And what the hearing specialists are there for is to help the family understand the things they need to do so the child hears while they're communicating and interacting. Um, and what we've learned also since universal newborn hearing is that outcomes are better when babies and toddlers with hearing loss have a specialized provider, an expert who has um, lots of experience and knowledge in hearing loss um, to help with families achieve their outcomes. Okay, Jackie is going to talk about developmental milestones now. <clears throat> um, hello. If you guys have any questions or anything, you know, be sure to put it in the chat box. Um, you know, we can always stop and answer questions and kind of have a running dialogue and any participation. So please feel free to do that. Um, the next four slides really show the progression of typical auditory development. Um, so for all of the assessors out there, um, you know, when you are when you get a kiddo and, and you know, they don't necessarily come in, you know, with the with the hearing loss, but maybe they're coming in with a communication delay, and um, you guys are looking at that development. And obviously, you're using one of your tools, um, but maybe you see, okay, this kid is nine months old, and and they're not responding to their name. You know, that's a hole. We don't want to see holes in that development. So that's a time where you would, you know, probably say, hey. Um, did you pass that newborn hearing screening? And even if they did pass that newborn hearing screening, they still might want to follow up with another hearing test. Um, you know, we know that with the developmental specialist or the developmental pediatricians, or even if they went to the hospital and had a speech evaluation, um, if their you know language is low and they're not communicating, that's the first thing they look at is hearing. So um, I can tell you, I hear time and time again, whether it's from a parent or even a DS or another provider, oh, I think they can hear because they they turned to me or they turned that bell during the Battelle. Um, again, like Sandy said, I think we just, we need to really reiterate that, that that's, it, it's not that black and white. You know, kids can fool us and, and they probably can hear the bell. And like Sandy said, maybe they're hearing Andy in that intonation, but not Sandy every time. Um, so when in doubt, um, at all, if you doubt at all, you know, that's something that, that should be recommended that they follow up with their hearing. Um, so again, like I said, the next um, four slides after this um, really go through that progression age by age. I'm not going to sit here and read these to you, but like Sandy said, they will be available for you to have as, as kind of a resource to look back. Um, so there's that. Okay, so there's some of that, like I said, information as far as um, normal auditory development. So the next piece um, that, that we're going to kind of dive into is start to look at then, you know, now you, you've had that information on audiology 101 and um, kind of some simple, you know, information for that. But now thinking about, you know, early intervention and the service team and the members of the team and when you guys actually get a referral for a kiddo with a hearing loss. So obviously everybody has their core team members um, and then each team also has additional team members. So hopefully everybody knows this, um, but each team does have access to your hearing and vision um, services. Um, and those members can act as you know a PSP and SSP and support you during teaming. Um, so again, everybody has access to that. So remembering they're part of your team, they're there to support you. Um, and there's a reason that they're part of their part of your team. So we know that with hearing loss, it's such a low incidence population um, that honestly, you may in some of these counties never have a kiddo with hearing loss for 10 years or maybe one or two. And then obviously, you know, our larger counties, um, you know, might have a half a dozen a year. Um, but again, it's such a low incidence population um, that that's why um, 
you know, the state nationally best practice to, to have that hearing specialist there to support you. Um, so again, like Sandy said too, when in doubt, especially when you're assessing, you know, call in your hearing provider. You know, that's um, that's key. You really want that person there there to help you, um, you know, take a look at the child and see if there's a need. You know, we know they already qualify. Um, you know, it's one of those diagnoses on the list. Um, but when you're assessing them, we, we really want to look at the need. And, um, you know, that's where they can really help to dig deeper. So, sorry, I'm not turning my slides here. Um, so, yeah, so a, a child is um, diagnosed with a hearing loss and referred to your county. Um, where do we begin and why? So, again, you know, best practice include that expert on your team. Um, you know, our we are that EI hearing service, that family training and counseling um, and really help to come up with those family outcomes. So, you know, we're getting most of these kiddos when they're babies. Um, you know, they, you know, they're born with this hearing loss and families just, they don't know what they don't know. So just a little bit of statistics here. Um, so we know that more than 96% of families who have a child with hearing loss have no history of hearing loss in their family, friends, you know, people they know. So families really have little knowledge of hearing loss or its implications. Um, you know, we often hear, we've done a lot of studies, a lot of family interviews on this. You know, they go to their audiology appointment. Once they hear my child has a hearing loss, um, they really don't hear anything else. You know, they miss that important information. Um, they just don't know what questions to ask. Um, so again, why is it so important to bring in that hearing specialist? It's really about, you know, digging deeper. Um, you know, once we work with families and, and able to ask these questions, these are a lot of the questions we hear. Why does my child have hearing loss? I want to understand what that hearing loss means. Where is it taking place? Where's the damage, the audiogram, their levels? Will it be progressive? Do they need aids in both ears? Um, you know, so on and so forth. So um, again, a lot of questions will, um, will come out if you kind of know what questions to ask. So really digging deeper, um, you know, to help families really come up with um, what is the need? You know, what is the need for that kiddo? Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to now get into some case studies. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about, you know, hearing loss in general, what any of that meant. Um, but now, you know, now would be a good time to ask that. Okay, um, so we're going to kind of talk about a, def a couple different paths as far as um, having kiddos coming in um, to early intervention. So kiddos coming in that are referred to early intervention with a diagnosed last um, and having kiddos come in that um, for other needs and, and not necessarily diagnosed with a hearing loss. Okay, so um, we're going to do some little question that we're not going to do a poll. We're just going to have you kind of write in the, um, the chat box. But so for example, you have a little a baby come in. The baby is born with profound hearing loss. Um, she's three months old and she is a candidate for a cochlear implant. Um, so obviously hearing loss makes her eligible. Um, and so the question really is, is there a need for service? Um, and, and the reason we're bringing this up because we've just seen this again time and time or time and time again. So um, these kiddos really do look great when they're little um, and families don't always have concerns because they just don't know what they don't know. So they're not showing any developmental delays. They know they're not going to even get the implant for a year. They'll have hearing aids on to keep, you know, that brain stimulated. Um, and maybe their the RBI showed that there's no concerns with routines, best baby, happy. Um, you know, so is there a need for service? So go ahead and, and tell us why or why not. Got some responses to see. Um, overwhelmingly so far, the answer is yes, absolutely. There would be a need for services to support the brain development. Um, one person says it depends on the parent's concerns. Um, I would say most people are responding yes. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and so, and so, yes, I obviously, yes, I agree. There is a need for service. And, and even that comment about the parents' concerns, I completely agree with that as well. I just think sometimes when, um, you know, we think about our kiddos with hearing loss and again, being that little, um, families really just don't know what they don't know. So really, you know, digging deeper, pulling in some of that, you know, family assessment information, information, as far as, um, you know, your hearing professionals have different resources that they can pull in um, to talk about things like, hey, how are those hearing aids going? Oh, well, they're going great. We just, you know, we squeeze those hearing aids, the batteries work, we put them in. Okay, well, there's so much more to that. So again, they just don't know. You know, there's we need to talk about Link 6 checks and we need to talk about saying the Link 6 when we listen to them because I can tell you, um, you know, the almost 16 years I've been doing this, I've never had a baby not have to send those hearing aids back in for repair um, because of drool and spit up and everything else getting into them. So there is a more, there, there's a better test to do. Um, and it's, it's not saying that their medical audiologist maybe didn't give them a handout about it or maybe talk about it briefly or maybe just didn't have time to talk about it. We all know those appointments are so quick and so overwhelming. Um, so that's that's a huge thing that that you know is a support to the family, and they didn't even know that they were supposed to be doing it. If that makes sense, um, I mean, I've I've gotten into a home and and have had a family, and and they're like, oh yeah, we've been checking it, and we just squeeze it. This battery is working well. We practiced a listening check, and the tubing was blocked. So yeah, it squeezed, the battery worked, but the sound was never getting through. And that baby wasn't getting sound probably for a good month. So um, again, just really digging deeper, you know, different supports that are out there, support groups, um, communication options. You know, a lot of times families will, you know, go to their professional and it will right away, here, this is, this is the therapy you need to be doing and not maybe given those options. So again, you know, giving them those options, just like I said, just not knowing what is out there. So, um, you know, these babies do look really good and, you know, maybe the parents don't have a concern because they just don't know. Um, I'm just going to jump, yes, please, go I'm ahead. just going to jump in a second. Um, I know in EI, we often um, like to use sign language as a bridge to language. And with our kiddos with hearing loss, that's a possibility as well. But for hearing loss, there's a, a historic controversy over whether or not families should use sign. And so families need to know about all of the modalities so they can make an informed decision. Um, I know where our office up here in Akron, um, families might go to one clinic and they'll say, just talk, 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 no sign, no sign. They may go to another clinic and um, be pulled over to, oh no, you have to be signing. So in EI, what we need to do is provide the family with all the information, um, introduce them to other families or resources that use different communication modalities and help the family make that um, decision. And if they are saying they want sign language, then we, we need to bring that into a full language. Um, man, I know it's not just signing more or signing sock. It's really starting to sign lots for that little baby because that's what they're going to depend on for their brain development. Okay. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next kiddo okay so you have a little baby come in um she's born with a mild hearing loss um she failed her newborn hearing screening she got hearing aids super early um she's babbling um and that family you know follows up and their only other provider is their clinical their medical audiologist um so again is there a need for service why or why not Let's see what we have. <clears throat> Says, what is a good sign? Well, there's a couple questions that came up. Um, most people are saying yes uh, for the caregiver to learn about communicating with a child. Um, 
some are asking for resources about are there um, any good websites to uh, demonstrate sign language. Uh, we may be duplicating, but if the parents um, aren't, and then we didn't finish, aren't being supported by their clinic, then it may be helpful. So that ideal of individualizing, um, you know, this determination. So um, it depends on whether the family needs this type of support. So if they're getting it elsewhere, they may not need early intervention. Um, so uh, we have got a couple no's. Says no, the child is typically developing. The family does not need the extra support. Most people are saying yes, especially if the parents are interested and have questions. Um, a lot of the no's are because they're thinking it's a duplication of services. Okay, well, and that's why I stuck that last little piece of information in there. So yeah, so they are seeing that clinical audiologist. Um, but what that, that, that medical clinical audiologist is completely different than, you know, the audiologist or speech therapist that that's on your EI hearing service team. Um, so, you know, they're going to go in and they're going to, you know, put them in the booth to make sure those hearing aids are giving them the access they need. Um, they're going to make ear molds for the kiddo, um, when they, you know, when they need new ear molds and yeah, when they get the hearing aids, they're going to give them that kit. And again, they're going to you know, have maybe that half an hour time or depending on the clinic day or, or whatnot. Um, and like I said, we've done this for a long time and we've done a lot of little research grants and, and pulling out families and asking questions along the way. And, and the majority will say, you know, it's super overwhelming just to get those hearing aids and figure out how to put them in our baby's ears. We miss everything else. Um, so I think that, you know, the difference of thinking that medical versus the EI and, and what that support can be. Um, so being there to really answer those questions and to then that booth testing, you know, you can, we can plot that audiogram, um, you know, every six months for a family and every time they're like, oh, now I get it, you know, or can we do that again? Or can we, you show my parents that? Or, you know, um, grandma and grandpa need to, to hear that too. So it, it's, it's kind of taking that medical clinical terminology and really making it family friendly um, and, and helping them to understand that and, and really put it into context of their daily routines. And oh, so they're not hearing that during the day when, you know, we're playing with this toy um, versus, versus some of that real medical terminology. Um, so yes, we are definitely that the EI hearing services are are completely different than that medical piece, um, and I think it goes back to again just not knowing, you know, what the resources are, and like Sandy said, that research that just came out, getting intervention before six months of age. Um, we know the implications that this can have later on, which is why these kiddos qualify automatically, because we know they're not going to most likely show a delay when they're little, um, when they're first born, um, even that first year. But but there's a reason why they do automatically qualify, because we know the long term progression um, and what delays can happen if they're not getting that intervention and that support. And um, just thinking back about that hearing loss simulator, what that mild hearing loss sounded like to families, e even without the child's hearing aid, that child's going to look like they respond pretty often. And what's so staggering is that babies who have mild hearing loss are the least likely to wear hearing aids. Um, families just don't see the need for it. Man, and those are the babies who, if they wore hearing aids, their outcomes would be Oh, it would just be so cool. Um, so that's why the family needs the support um, through EI to keep those hearing aids on, to be checking the hearing aids, to set up the environment so the baby hears with hearing aids. We know if we add that noise and distance, um, the child's not going to be hearing and that we know kiddos with hearing loss need to hear at least three times a word more than their kiddos with normal hearing. And that's because they miss out on opportunities to hear when the family isn't close by talking to them. That was our, our spiel there. Other questions, Does that is that making sense for people? 
And I know you had said something about resources. Um, so absolutely, there are a ton of resources out there. I think that it just is dependent on what what the child needs type thing. Like Sandy said, um, you know, even myself as a speech therapist, we often want to say, oh, yeah, do sign. Well, that might be different when you have a kiddo with hearing loss and depending on what communication modality they have chosen and, and what supports that. So I think as far as resource goes, definitely reach out to your EI service provider based on that kiddo and what they need. Um, I would say a great signing resource, like if you just have a kiddo in general that, um, you know, maybe has a, a speech delay and the family does want to use it as a bridge, um, baby signing time. Um, you can actually access all those now on YouTube. Um, those are my favorite. Um, and, you know, so those are, are great for a bridge. I used them with my own three kiddos. So, um, that's one of my favorite, but but again, there's when we talk about kids with hearing loss, there are specific programs out there, and there's programs throughout the country that are free um, just because of having a kiddo with a hearing loss. So, um, so yeah, your your provider should be full of all of those resources to help support you and, and the families you're serving. Okie dokie. Please, if you feel like you have a question, just interject, send a message. Okay, so um, so that's one path that could, a family might take to getting into EI. Um, I recently was meeting with another county and um, trying to find out how referrals were coming in. And I found out we were talking about two, two different things, almost two different languages, because I wanted to um, talk to them about being part of the um, assessment when the child first enters early intervention. But Would they it be possible to ask a question? We have a, a couple questions about the Absolutely. sign language sign language yep. conversation. So um so given the idea that um, children need language experiences to support and create pathways in the brain, can you explain how experiencing sign language versus spoken language impacts that? And then can you send out the link for the research that you referenced out of Cincinnati? Um, oh. and yeah, let me make a note for that from Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And then um, Corey would um, like to use the liveprint.com photos to uh, copy and print out for families. I think she's just asking if that's okay. Yes. For sure. And then, and then someone's asked, "What kind of EI services are available for children with young, with uh, hearing loss?" And, and so, could they expound on that more? Um, I will ask. But those are the questions so far. Okay. And then also, as far as talking about brain development and sign language or spoken language, wow. There are books written on that. Um, if you want to give me your contact, I can send you some articles on that. Um, we, as part of our contract with the state, we need to be unbiased um, so that parents can make the best decision that matches their family. Um, but absolutely, I'd love to share some of that with you. And I don't know if we, we even talked, I know we keep we keep talking about it and saying the terms, but I think like when Sandy was giving the examples, she was talking about maybe a child who was receiving a cochlear implant. So um, a cochlear implant is a tool um, that would give a child who is severe to profound or profoundly deaf access to be able to listen and, and hear. Um, so it, it's not a it's not a language of its own, but it's a tool. So when when you know it's it's a it's a very large, expensive surgery, a lot goes involved into it. Um, but but if a child chooses and gets that implant, um, a lot of times then their medical professionals will push them on the the path of auditory verbal therapy. And so that's one of those communication modalities that um, you know believes that to get the best out of that tool, listening and speaking. Um, you know, it is the best modality for that child. And if we introduce sign, um, they may revert to that and, and not use the listening and the speaking. 
But if we're not, sense. but we're right. not saying that. Right. But I'm just giving you an example of what different maybe communication camps believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times in their, you know, the medical professionals will, will recommend what they believe, not necessarily what options are out there. So that's a huge difference too, versus the medical versus us in, in early intervention is that we're here to give them the information, tell them where the research is, um, walk them through, you know, like what modality would be best for our family um, and, and then support them in choosing whatever they choose and then the resources for that. So um, again, we've countless times, you know, and, and not on the fault of anybody, but you know, maybe I'm an SSP with with um, a PSP and, you know, they're, oh, you have a hearing loss here, you should sign. And not, you know, because that's just kind of what people may think. Well, then we have to go back and say, okay, but wait, this family has chosen auditory verbal therapy and they're spending all this time going to therapy. You know, we need to make sure that they understand that, you know, this is one camp that you're doing. And now if we introduce this, is this what you want? That type of thing. So it, it more goes into it than just saying, this is what we think you need. Um, you know, we need to support them, but we, we need to give them the tools to make the best decision. So hopefully that helps. Okay. All right. Did we, did we miss a question? I feel like we might have missed a question. Um, I think we got it. If we miss something, please jump in. I think you got everything um, except that one question um, about what EI services might be available to um, infant or toddler with a hearing loss, um, but they have not clarified their question yet. Okay. okay. I mean, obviously, if, you know, within the state of Ohio and the model that we follow, you would have your EI hearing service provider. Beyond that, if you wanted to look into something private, um, then yes, there are resources within each community of, you know, whether it's just, you know, speech therapy or specific AV therapy um, or connecting them with a, an actual in-person sign class or an online sign class um, or, you know, the deaf community, a deaf mentor. So again, oh yes, there's, there's absolutely a ton of resources and I think it more based on that child and what they need. Right. So it could look like uh, the family. Um, family training, the counseling and home visit services that FCLC provides. It could be speech language pathology, audiology services, and all those um, other examples. Um, it, the key is it's individualized right. based on uh, the family and the child's unique needs and priorities and concerns. So that's why it's very, very important that we have the right people at the right place at the right time identifying and assisting the family with identifying the needed services and supports. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to give you a little example. So I have a little kiddo that I serve um, and she has a cochlear implant. And so she does receive the, you know, specialized auditory verbal therapy. Um, the family is included in the therapy, but it, you know, it's one-on-one. -on -one. They're working with the child directly. And so, you know, it, it's come about, you know, and then we, and then I, you know, meet with the family as well through the, the tele-intervention, you know, and the family has said, you know, we enjoy going there. Um, we're just not quite sure why they're doing what they're doing. So it, it's actually been a really nice pairing because, you know, we kind of talk about that and then I'm able to say, okay, well, when they're doing, when, you know, when they're, when they're, you know, maybe taking the, the, the little animals and, and playing with her and making the sounds, you know, they're they're really wanting her to um, practice with these learning to listen sounds we talk about. And how can she do that through the day? Well, let's think about all the sounds that happen in your house, you know, that type of thing. So it's been a nice transition to help them kind of take that more direct therapy model and bring it home because, you know, they know if we're not, you know, doing the stuff at home, you know, she can't generalize that in that one hour therapy a week. Um, but, but so it's been helpful to make it meaningful. And that's not all my families, but that is working for that family. So like you said, individualized, what, what that family needs. And making the most out of routines, because that's exactly, I love that example you gave, exactly what we do. The family will say, well, this is what we're doing at the clinic and we'll help. Okay, how can we build this into the routine so the child does get it in a meaningful and functional setting? Um, okay, so 
the other path the child can take or family can take to get into EI is the child who's already in early intervention but does not yet have a diagnosed hearing loss. Um, and, and you may say, but we've got universal hearing <clears throat> screening. Why wouldn't we already have these kiddos diagnosed? Well, first off, um, babies are being screened at a wonderful rate before they leave the hospital. Not all families will follow up um, for their diagnostic hearing loss. Some families absolutely will. They're told to do it. They'll follow through. Some hospitals help them schedule that diagnostic. But even aside from those, what we know now, and we didn't know this 20 years ago, were that a number of hearing loss that kids get are late onset. That means they're born with normal hearing and um, <clears throat> a few months, a few years later, they get their hearing loss. Um, <clears throat> or it could be progressive. And we've seen this child may enter um, early intervention with a mild hearing loss and over time um, it becomes poorer. And then there's those kiddos with hearing loss in one ear and for the longest time, people were saying, eh, don't worry about it. Um, he still has one good ear. And we now know that that's not so, that these kiddos with hearing loss in even one ear um, are more likely to have to repeat a grade in school because they haven't experienced all of that language and opportunities to hear and see the language. And also what we found is that babies who are born with unilateral hearing loss, over time that can develop into a hearing loss in both ears. So these are the kiddos you may be seeing who are not yet diagnosed. Um, and so what we're gonna look at now are some of the syndromes that kiddos may have that um, also include hearing loss, some of the risk factors, um, that might signal, ooh, this child needs a hearing loss and some of the red flags. So here's our little guy. Um, he was, he passed universal newborn hearing screening. He is diagnosed with Strickler syndrome. Um, he's in early intervention and through the team's assessment um, or evaluation, his speech, we know his speech and language is delayed. Parents are saying, hey, he claps. When we clap, he claps too. So he must be hearing okay. And the pediatrician saying, don't worry about it. His siblings are doing all his talking for him, which is something we've actually had a physician say. So my question to you is, that, is there a need for a hearing evaluation or to get your um, hearing services provider involved? Tell me why or why not? Um, yes, uh, we're getting yeses because they could have a hearing issue. Mm -hmm. um, yes, because he should have his hearing checked. Yes, he may be uh, imitating but not hearing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, need to rule out hearing loss. So I think the yes, I yeah. we have no no's. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, <laughs> um, and, and here's here's a list of syndromes, and Strickler is one of those syndromes that um, can include hearing loss. Plus, I believe there's a you have an even longer list in that hearing screening document um, through EI. <clears throat> so, yeah, that would be one reason to um, look into hearing loss, as well as his speech and language, as we said, is delayed. Um, I'm going to take a look back at his. Um, oh, and this is one. Parents said when they clap, baby claps too. Well, baby might have enough hearing to hear that clapping and clap along, or baby just might see family clapping and they're going to clap too. And if they clap too, mom and dad are going to get happy and clap more and baby's going to clap more too. So um, yeah, we can't count on that observation as a signal that baby's hearing. 
Um, and what we know is that there are about 400 genetic causes for hearing loss. Um, it, it takes, a, the odds aren't that great for that two people with two different genes will come together and have a baby, but it certainly happens. And two third of the babies who have hearing loss um, that is genetic, it's not, it doesn't come with the syndrome. So there won't be other signs um, to go along with it. Okay, next baby. It's a cutie pie sleeping. Um, this child is two years old, was born four weeks early, and was in the um, intensive care for four weeks, and was given antibiotics for three weeks, was also on oxygen, and early on passed the newborn hearing screening. And now that um, he's in early intervention, you've determined that language is delayed. What do you say? Is there a need for hearing evaluation or for um, EI hearing services? Why or why not? We've got a yeah. Oh, here they come. Yes. Um, retesting, retest the hearing, especially if in NICU. Yes, due to the medical history. Yes, the language delay alone could be a sign that there is a hearing loss. And as was said before, most cases of hearing loss have a later onset. And another one pointed out the child was on oxygen. Um, so due to birth history and language delays, uh, most people, there are no no's. <laughs> okay. Yeah, man, you guys got it. Yep. Because um, babies who are in the NICU um, for more than three weeks on antibiotics and given oxygen, those are all red flags, um, risk factors for hearing loss. And there we go again, delayed language. Um, so here's a list of high risk factors for hearing loss, and this will be included in your um, PowerPoint packet so you could um, look back at it. Um, one thing we didn't mention was um, family history of permanent hearing loss. Hopefully, if there's a history of it, the, the physician is following that and recommending follow-up testing. Maternal infections is a high risk factor. If you're looking at the baby and they their ears look kind of funky, that's not very medical, but there may be a need for the hearing test. We see kiddos with extra tags in there beside their ears or um, ear pits beside their ears. Certainly taking ototoxic meds for a while um, can cause hearing loss. Um, kiddos who are treated for cancer, some of those medications um, also can cause hearing loss and um, also make the child more susceptible to hearing loss from noise. Um, we've already discussed the syndromes and, and, and being premature and also hyperbilirubin. Um, being jaundice at birth can be a risk factor as well. Okay, here's our last case history. We have a seven month old, of course, past UNHS because that's what we're talking about. No history of hearing loss in the family, but at six months, not imitating, has not begun to babble. Doc said, don't worry about it. There's so much going on in the home. You have a big family, no concern. So what do you say? Is there a need for a hear possible hearing test or to get your specialists involved? Let's see. We've got an absolutely. Um, yes, yes, yes to rule out a hearing loss. Keep the answers coming. Yes, sounds like possible cognitive delays as well, but hearing should be done to rule out. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always um, good um, to rule out hearing. Um, she should have her hearing tested since she's not babbling or imitating sounds. Um, yes, better chance for a child if there is a hearing loss and that she gets the assistance that she needs. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> someone said find a new doctor. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Write that in the IFSB here. <laughs> um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, just as an aside, um, here at FCLC, we do have a clinic where um, Dr. Foster sees kiddos um, the possibility of autism. And before she makes that diagnosis, we always do a hearing test before. Um, certainly kiddos with autism and hearing loss can look a lot alike. And ruling out, auti ruling out hearing loss is one of the simpler things we can do. Um, and just so you all know, you know, hearing loss can be covered through BCMH um, as a diagnostic. And also before we go on, I wanted to be sure you guys all knew that um, there's all kinds of funding sources for the family to get hearing aid. You know, certainly there's Medicaid and BCMH, but there's also something called the Ohio Hearing Aid Assistance Program. And that's actually for middle-class families. Um, and they still have to be eligible financially and not every hospital works with it, but there are ways um, for families to get hearing aids so they don't have to pay for it or seek that as well, which is so important because so many of our families are young, just bought a new house, and now they're getting a $5,000 bill for hearing aids. It's, wow, another barrier to helping their baby along. So good reason to be using your EI hearing services specialist. And I just did have a, another point to touch on that I forgot to earlier. So um, when the program used to be called RIP, you know, we would get the referrals directly from the hospital on these babies that did not pass. So, um, you know, we were the ones making those phone calls and, and talking to the families and then referring them to Help Me Grow. So just so everyone's aware, that's not happening anymore. Um, you know, it's just like any other referral, it's going straight to the, the central intake site. Um, and then they're calling the families. Um, and then, you know, the, the service coordinator will then get them on their caseload. So, um, we have definitely found that to be, I think, another barrier. So if you're, you know, in your county, if you're maybe calling a family and that's, you know, the, the, the reason for the referral, they have a diagnosed hearing loss and, and you could definitely get one of these families like, no, why would I need intervention? My baby's great. My baby's feeding well and sleeping well. And you know what I mean? Again, they just don't know what they don't know. Please reach out to your EI hearing provider. They can definitely give you tips. Um, even some articles to send to the family, you know, talk you through why this family should at least go through the, you know, um, the assessment process. So, um, you know, again, utilize, utilize your, your team member um, because they are your team member and, and it's, everybody has one and it's free. You're not paying anything extra. Um, you know, it, it's part of your service. It's part of, of, of the services through DODD. It's part of your team. So, um, I can't, you know, stress that enough. Um, and, and so, yeah. 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 That's it. We're here to support you guys and the family. Oh my gosh. Yes. So going back to what we were just finishing up. So here are some lists of red flags, um, which that baby showed. Um, and we do, uh, we need to remember is that um, hearing loss is going to look different on each baby. Um, but even still, hearing is a large part of the foundation of how a baby um, learns, and we've just got to catch it early. Um, red flags, we could just chat about these briefly because these may be some things um, you'll see during the evaluation or home visits. Um, lack of a startle, not responding to sounds, and then again, think again, um, responding to some sounds but not all, responding to sounds in quiet but not in noise, from close but not far away, babies who aren't soothed by soft sounds, certainly you guys are the specialists as far as figuring out other reasons why baby may not be soothed by soft sounds, but hearing loss ought to be ruled out as well. Um, when parents walk into the room and baby doesn't stir while they're sleeping, on the other hand, that wouldn't be enough to, if there are other red flags, um, you know, the baby who does wake up when family walks in could be doing it just through tactile 
or even catching it from the corner of their eye. Um, and then by two months, the baby should have some vowel sounds um, and should quiet it when they hear a familiar voice. Then as we move up, certainly as a baby gets older, we want to see them doing more things. By four to eight months, they want to um, turn their head or shift their eyes towards the sound. So yet yeah, baby could react to mom clapping, but not turn to where that's happening. Um, doesn't seem to enjoy toys that um, shake or make noises. Certainly babies may enjoy toys that vibrate. Um, but if, if it's just a, to a toy that makes noise and the baby doesn't care for it, hmm, that might be a red flag. We've already talked about imitating sounds and that's something you guys certainly have experience with. They're not babbling. If they don't respond to no, we're not saying that they're going to follow no, um, but just even stop for a second in recognition of no. Um, and again, they seem to hear some sounds, but not others. Okay, and other reasons for hearing tests would be um, the family has some kind of concern and oh my gosh, we want to just believe in mom and dad. Um, they're the ones with the child all the time and beyond any other professional, they've got a good handle on that. Certainly delays in speech and language. If the baby has a lot of middle ear problems, a head trauma to the skull, different infections, exposure to potentially damaging noise. I mean, that would have to be pretty loud and extensive. And then um, ototoxic meds. And I just have another example. I, um, I mean, I have a family now. So, I mean, it, it, it's definitely happening where the baby passed her newborn hearing screening and within, um, I think mom said within six months, probably six months of age, she was like, I don't think she can hear. And the pediatrician would not listen to her. And she had that kind of insurance that you had to have a referral. Um, so she ended up going back for like a sick visit closer to the age of one and got a different pediatrician, mentioned it again, and she gave her the referral. And sure enough, she was deaf. Like it progressed that much. So, you know, again, yes, that parent instinct and, and you guys as, as also their provider helping them to come up with the resources, then yet, whether it's using BCMH or reaching out to your provide, you know, EI hearing service provider to help, you know, get the resources to, yeah, push through it and get that hearing test done. We do have a question um, from Tammy. Uh, well, before that, I want uh, to share a comment that Yolanda made that I think is really, really good. It was um, in response to the previous question. She says, time is the issue. She has passed six months. So she caught that the importance uh -huh. of the age and the time. And I thought that was very impressive, Yolanda. Um, the question is, you um, and I'm just reading um, what uh, Tammy wrote, you keep mentioning they don't know what they don't know uh, with regard to parents. Would you please share some very basic or first information I should share with parents? Yeah, and you know where we got um, that, thanks for that question, is we're, I, I failed to mention, we work a lot with Hands and Voices, which is a parent organization for kiddos um, who have hearing loss and it's parent driven. And oh my gosh, that's something that um, the families tell us so often is they, they don't know what to ask. They didn't know what to ask. So some of those would be, do we have some of those listed here? Or I'm gonna look for my assessment. I mean, I think, I think too, it goes more into, you know, like as they go through things again, back with the hearing aids, like they didn't, they just don't know, you know, they're given this hearing aid set and they're, you know, the hearing aids in the kit and they're told, okay, you know, um, check the batteries if they're working and then, um, you know, here's how you change it out, that type of thing, but, but not really given the information about, about the Ling six and do they sound, um, clear or, you know, that type of thing. So, I mean, it goes far, you know, into or even understanding the audiogram. Oh, wow, I didn't know that that was really what they could hear and, and the speech sounds that they could hear. Um, and that, you know, I should, this kind of background noise, you know, shouldn't be there or where I should be positioned or how far. Um, 
you know, those are the things that maybe their medical providers aren't, aren't telling them. That's more of the education piece. And they don't even know what questions to ask. Um, you know, even things like, you know, they, I've had families come in and say, oh, well, I just think it's really too loud. You know, it, putting these hearing aids on and, and we are, you know, we're going to their cousin's birthday party and it's loud. So I just took them out. Or, you know, I'd rather just not wear them when we're at the park or when we are at the mall, because what if they lose them? Well, I'd rather them get that language experience and here's tools to help make sure they don't lose them. So things like that, that, that again, they just don't even know the questions to ask. Um, and what, if you would use your early intervention hearing services provider at the assessment, they'd be there to dig deeper. Um, and use their experience for when a parent says something, that could be a light bulb to lead down another path of questions to address the family's concerns. Um, and I think, too, you know, part of that assessment that we might pull in is talking about communication modalities, which, again, they may have just been told at the beginning, this is the modality that we're recommending and you're using, may not even know that there's, you know, a plethora of them out there. Um, or why did this happen? Genetic testing. What does that mean? Why would I want genetic testing? What can that even tell me? Um, or, you know, if I, families say, I want to do all the communication modalities. I want to give them everything and they can choose later. Well, you know, there's different reasons why that could be successful or not. And, and, and we're here to give them that information. Um, so, so many things that, that again, here to bring up and talk about and, and pull out that need. Um, so I, I hope that makes sense. It, it's not like just black and white for each family. And, and again, we've had tons of families. Yep. I'm comfortable with the hearing aid. I know everything about it. But then when you start asking those questions, you know, okay, well, tell me how you're listening to it. Tell me, you know, what, what you're doing when you're, um, cleaning it at night. Oh, I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, those dig deeper questions. Um, and, and even, um, asking how often, are you putting it on the baby? How long does the baby wear it? What's cool now with technology is that the audiologist can hook the hearing aids up and check the data logging, which not every family knows. So while mom may be thinking she's putting it on all day, the audiologist can say, oh, you know, it's really only been three hours. And that's something we could dig into as well and help support the team and the family to keep those hearing aids on. And I mean, too, even things like we've had families that will say, um, you know, oh, the audiologist recommended that oh, tell me uh, yeah, I have a kiddo that I'm serving that the family came back from the appointment and said, oh, yeah, the, we were deciding whether to switch from one type of hearing aid to another. And the family interpreted the visit as, oh, yeah, we, you know, the audiologist um, told us to just take a break for six months and then we'll come back and decide if we should do the other one. And I was like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm able to reach out to that audiologist, you know, have that that connection with that provider. And she was and it was the complete opposite. She was like, oh, no, no, I told them to wear it for six months and then we'll come back and booth test. So. <laughs> Again, even some of that interpretation of what what they're pulling away from those visits, believe me, it is not easy to understand. Like I said, we can plot an audiogram, you know, I mean, a dozen times for a family. And every time we do it, they're like, oh, yeah, now I get it again. You know, so. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, I guess it's such a we're giving so many different, you know, examples of it. Um, but there are just so many other questions. And I think from the experience that we've had with so many families and, and these tools that we used to be able to dig deeper and see, um, oh, yeah, there is a need. And the families may not even know that there's a need. Um, so I hope that answered. Um, our last um, slide here is similar to what Yolanda had mentioned was um, best practice for speech and um, hearing therapist is when they do start a, a child or a baby with um, for s speech therapy, they should have a current hearing test. And so that's something um, to be thinking about as well, how important it is when we see delays. 
um, or inconsistent behavior that the kiddo has their hearing test and or you can consult with us and we can help there or consult with your EI hearing services provider and the expert can help. When in doubt, refer. And there's our contact info. Anything else we can tell you about? Kind of have an open mic right now. <laughs> Two content experts around hearing. Any questions? Any any situations that you've had recently that you now kind of thinking about the information that they shared, and you're thinking, oh, maybe I should have done this instead. Any aha moments? And and I'll just share another um, situation we had. Um, we started a family. Um, after the assessment was done and in EI and the family got their hearing aids and um, they were telling it was in fact Jackie that they had um, paid for the aids mm. and and what a hardship that was and so we helped the family backpedal and work with the audiologist and use some other funding sources um, that the audiologist wasn't aware of and certainly the family wasn't um so even wow what a great impact that made for the family and the child and their financial situation yeah and even speaking of that you know there is funding in ohio for things like fm systems um which attached to their hearing aids um it basically like if you think about a kiddo in school the teacher is wearing a mic so the parent or the you know whoever the kiddo's with and it kind of puts that sound right into their ear and, and cuts away the distance background noise that type of thing anyway um historically that device is not paid by anything you know it, it, you, insurance nothing pays for it, bcmh and so there is special funding out there now. And so even that, you know, we are even, you know, helping families to get that because their audiologists just aren't telling, you know, aren't automatically telling them about it all the time. Um, so I think it's remembering that kind of medical kind of, you know, boom, 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 back to back mm -hmm. patients and, you know, kind of, um, you know, getting through their appointments where we can help with that education piece of it. And resource linkage. And mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? And so you can always pull up the map to see who your provider is. Um, like Dan said, we are um, in 55 counties, so not all the counties, um, but you, everybody does have a provider. Oh, I think we have something coming through. Let's see. just getting some gratitude as far as thank you for your time Jackie and Sandy oh, well, thank you um, tell um, where um, can we find the map on our website okay so Diane where can you find that map on your website <laughs> okay they're not gonna be able to see my screen okay so you would go to Ohio early intervention dot org and let's see. And you know what? We could um also we could post it along with the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Yes, we could go in, under local, state, and national resources. So you're in the provider tab, the yellow with the gold band, and then local, state, and national resources. And to the left are four tiles. The bottom tile is Ohio hearing and vision services and you just click on that and the map will appear and then also please feel free to email us if you want to know more about the communication con modalities you want to know more about the research um, more about our role and best practice we're here to support share the email again and I, I typed it um, share the email again and where to send the sign-in sheet oh okay. uh lori can you do that yes i'm in the process of doing that okay right now. okay okay 
Um, we, um, Lori will post the PowerPoint um, to our training website. So and correct me if I'm wrong, Lori. Uh, well, how about you? Um, where will you post the uh, PowerPoint? Okay, so I will post it actually below the course description for this training. So if you go to, again, the Providers tab, and then go to Professional Development and Training, and then there's a tile called Trainings, um, and then you'll just scroll down to where it says Donuts with Dye Hearing, and it will be posted um, underneath the description there. And if you need uh, training certificates from past Donuts with Dye, uh, email Shaquila Dixon, uh, which I think Lori shared that um, email address earlier, but I'll send it again. And then also remember on the person, your AI hearing service person on your team, if you have more questions about hearing, want to learn more about it, you've got that support there in your county. So use it. Yes. All right. Okay. Jackie and Sandy, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing this um, information. It was highly beneficial to me and I'm sure many, many others. Um, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of DODD for taking your time and doing such a thorough job. Uh, enjoyed the videos and the pictures and the concrete explanations. I really appreciated that a lot. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll hang out for a minute or two just in case you're in the middle of typing up your, your question. But otherwise, feel free to log off if you don't have any other questions. And on behalf of uh, the Department of Developmental Disabilities, Ohio Early Intervention, and Jackie and Sandy and Lori and myself, thank you so much for joining us for this Donuts with Di. Um, check in in May, and our topic will be autism.